Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. The famous Negro spiritual Keep Your Eyes on the Prize captures the spirit of Matthew chapter 10. The hymn calls to mind an array of scriptural passages to encourage and enjoin the faithful to run the race set before them. In its famous verse, Keep your hand on the gospel plow, won't take nothing for my journey now, the hymn's anonymous authors understand that in the work the Bible demands of us, we are fed only by the commandment that sends us. For, Scripture says, do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 5 to 10. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 280 of the Bible as Literature podcast. Last week, Richard, we talked about the symbolism of the names of the 12. It's important to point out that the connections we drew about table fellowship with the Gentiles, about the problem of militarism, and some of the leaps we took in explaining the names, which rely heavily on Father Paul's scholarship, all of these connections are a kind of overview of the meaning and direction of the total narrative. Right. Like the genealogy in chapter 1, these names tell a kind of story. Here we find it in the middle of chapter 10. One of the most significant things about this list is that it jams in this unfortunate detail of the betrayal that Judas Iscariot will commit. There is this note of melancholy that's there in this list. We can't just say, oh, these are just the guys that he sent out. Oh, this is just a bunch of people, and they happen to have these names, because obviously the author is trying to do something and trying to say something other than just listing these people. Because in other times, it said the 70 and didn't feel the need to list out 70 names. Here it's the 12, and he did list out the names. We talked about the order, and we talked about the meaning and the different directions that this can go, whether it's the sword or the gift. But Matthew's already tipped his hat, reminding us that it's not going to end well for Jesus. You know, I want to challenge our listeners in your own Bible study, in your churches, with your friends, anytime you gather to work on these texts, take the time to look at these names, make the effort to push the text, because These stories were not written in the age of word processors and infinite supplies of paper. Writing was expensive and difficult. The materials were not readily available. And in that setting, someone took time to put every one of these names down without any spaces on the manuscript. I mean, the writing materials were so precious that They literally just wrote an endless string of letters, and it was incumbent upon the one reading the text to the assembly to figure out where the words separated. So just think about that, and then ask yourself why we take every word so seriously. Precisely. The preciousness of these materials. I mean, we find ancient manuscripts that are on top of other manuscripts. They reused paper that they had already written on. They would have a paper and then they would paint it over and they would write another text on top of it. We can actually see with x-rays now, we're looking at an ancient manuscript that there's another manuscript underneath it. So the preciousness of every letter is important, not in a spiritual sense, but in a very pragmatic sense. I mean, they did not have the time and materials to just put a bunch of extra details just in case you may be interested later on. And don't forget, this wasn't just done once. This was done generation after generation after generation as copyists brought this text down to us. So we can't assume that it's in vain. 
if there's a piece of the text that you're tempted to skip over because it's boring or it's unpleasant in some other way, those are the ones that you should really pay attention to. Those are the ones that you should lean into. My students used to post on Facebook quoting my famous line, lean into the pain. If there's a text that's painful because it's boring, because it's unpleasant, because it's violent, because it raises your hackles because of something, those are the texts you need to really delve into. So I second your notion, Father, that when our listeners gather together to discuss these texts, the ones that they're tempted to skip over Spend a little extra time on those. These 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The minute I hear verses 5 and 6, Richard, the first thing that comes to mind is Paul's letter to the Romans, and the special status of Israel as God's chosen, that is to say, his oldest child, which is the child that bears the burden of the instruction, having received it first, and is the child that God holds up as an example of his instruction for all the nations. So it seems intuitive that once again, after the pattern of the entire scriptural narrative, God would again go first to the people of Israel, the insiders, those who were first called by his instruction. And it's beautiful how the text eliminates every other group. I mean, first it says you're not allowed to go to the nations, and then secondly, you're not allowed to go to these other ones who are also receivers of the Torah, the Samaritans. But they were considered second class if you look at what happened in Ezra and Nehemiah and the people in the land and all this kind of thing. And so the people of Israel, the Judahites, the Jews, were supposed to be the creme de la creme. The people to whom they would have to go first would be these insiders. Jesus is saying something very specific, that they are not allowed to go to the outsiders. They begin with the insiders, and beginning with the insiders is key to what Jesus is doing. Jesus has been working on the Pharisees and the scribes and the insiders, and now Jesus is taking his 12 students and sending them out, apostili, related to the word apostolos, apostle. He's sending them out to the core, and that's where you begin, and that's where it's always most difficult because in our own institutions, in our own churches, we don't want to reform from the inside. We don't want to start on the inside. We want to start by going to the outsiders. But when you start with the outsiders, you ignore the problems on the inside. You ignore the unfaithfulness and the self-satisfaction and the ego and all those symptoms of the rotten core of sin that human beings have. Richard, last week we talked about Matthew's name as a kind of dividing line emphasized here because of his position as number eight in the list as a way of signaling to the addressee of the story that this is a kind of last chance. So then in verse six, when you hear Jesus saying, that you have to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, what you hear is a playing out of this last chance. Okay, before we go to the Gentiles, and even though we don't know what happens at the end of Matthew because we're not there yet, we do know that there were conflicting names in the list of the Twelve that brought a Gentile element into the metaphor of the Twelve tribes. So what I hear in verse 6 is, this is the last chance, and we have to go after those on the inside who are lost so that we can reach them with this last chance. And I think it's fair to say that there's an implication that we're going to move on if they don't answer the call because of the metaphor of these names and, you know, in general, other hints in the Gospel of Matthew leading up to chapter 10. And this verse is interesting because there's an ambiguity in the Greek to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Does this mean to those lost individuals in the house of Israel among those who are not lost? Or does it mean that the house of Israel is lost sheep by definition? The Greek is ambiguous, but 
the point is it's looking at those who are lost who are supposed to be found whether they are the entire house or only members of the house it's those that are supposed to be following the shepherd they have the word they have the voice of the shepherd if i can bring in john and now he's going to see who of those need a shepherd and who need to be following and that's the job of these 12. it's not an encouraging message it really feels to me in context of the names as an ultimatum as in this is the last chance for these lost sheep to accept the proclamation of the gospel and as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand so there you have it in verse 7 they're lost and now the kingdom is here now the anointed one of israel god's messiah is here you can't miss this opportunity it has already this feeling of what we know will emerge as the many kingdom parables of matthew you have one last chance don't miss that chance it is a last chance because if you're a wandering sheep and you don't know where you're going and a shepherd just happens to find you if you don't follow that shepherd what are you going to do wait for the next shepherd you will not get another chance so you either follow the shepherd or you try to do it on your own and a sheep in the syrian desert will not make it on its own the sheep needs the shepherd the sheep needs the flock if it's going to survive. Here, we go back to this language of the kingdom of heaven. We haven't had the kingdom of heaven for a while. Remember, in the first few chapters, the kingdom of heaven was something that Jesus kept saying over and over again. And now, he's putting that word into the mouths of these apostles. Their job is now to say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. At hand is interesting because it's ingiken in Greek, which means it has approached, it has become close. They are within reach of this kingdom. These apostles are not just going out to talk. They're going out to invite them to follow the shepherd, to follow this king to the kingdom of the heavens. They are offered this opportunity to be citizens of this kingdom. And remember specifically, these are the insiders of the insiders. You may belong to this kingdom. But of course, one thing that they like about being insiders of insiders is that they have their own institution. They have their own kingdom. They have their own shepherd, so they believe. It's not just an ultimatum, follow this shepherd. It is a sharp dividing line. You're either following the shepherd or you're not following the shepherd. You can't just kind of follow the shepherd and kind of doing your own thing or kind of following two shepherds at the same time. You can't do it. You either are following the shepherd or you have rejected the shepherd. You're either a citizen of the kingdom or you have rejected the kingdom. And Richard, I'm so glad you brought the Greek into the discussion of verse 7 because this verb, and gizo, implies that the kingdom is near at this moment but has not come yet. I want to be clear. The kingdom in Scripture is always ahead of us. It's always coming. And this threat of the Lord's judgment is given to put pressure on us to change the way we conduct our affairs in the present. That's how judgment works. So what I hear in verse 7, and by the way, the verb is perfect, active, indicative. So the kingdom really is near. It's not here but it's very near. The pressure is being brought to bear on the house of Israel. The Messiah is in your midst. This is your last chance. Repent. This is your last opportunity to submit to his kingdom in the content of his instruction. So it's the pressure of the coming kingdom with an extra punch. And then in verse 8, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. He is hitting all of the critical notes from Scripture, all of the signs that this kingdom is on the move, that this kingdom is coming close. And then he is reiterating the threat to his disciples. You received 
God's instruction. You were the firstborn of God's household. You are responsible to share it with all of the other children. You received it freely. You must give freely. These are all actions, healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, casting out devils. These are all things that Jesus has already done. Jesus begins with the teaching and then he heals. Then he says, go out, preach, and then heal. Jesus is charging the disciples to do precisely what he did because of the fly in the ointment a few verses ago. We know it's not going to end well, but this is Jesus's hope. Jesus is hoping to send out disciples who are going to do what he did, preach and heal. I want to add on to what you said, Father, the freely you have received and freely give. They are not allowed to buy and sell this teaching. They are not allowed to use this teaching. They are not allowed to profit from this teaching. They are not allowed to profit or gain from the healing that they've done, just like Jesus. Jesus has not gained anything from what he's done. Jesus is only doing what must be done. Jesus is only doing what he was charged with doing. So since Jesus is following the will of his Father to do what must be done, he now charges his own disciples to go do what must be done. Preach that the kingdom has come near. All of this hints at shepherdism, because when you live in the field, Richard, you receive freely. The grass grows because the Lord wills it, because the Lord in Matthew causes gentle showers to fall upon the evil and the good. So when you're with your flock, you have something to feed them. The land is open and spacious, so you can always go where there's water, where there's more resources, where there's more opportunity for life, and you don't have to pay anything for any of it. There's no mortgage on the grasslands. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts, because you don't need it. Everything you need is in the gospel. This calls to mind the beautiful Negro spiritual, keep your eyes on the prize. They have this beautiful verse in the refrain of the hymn. Of course, they're talking about slavery in an American context, holding on to the gospel as a light in the darkness of their struggle, and they talk about putting their hand on the gospel and taking nothing for the journey. So there's this understanding that you don't need anything but the teaching. Everything you need is already provided in the content of the gospel, which opens to us the kingdom of God. In the Sermon on the Mount, there's only one judge that you are allowed to care about. There's also only one provider you're allowed to seek from. You're not allowed to ask the people you healed to provide for you. You're not allowed to ask those who receive the kingdom to provide for you, or you're not allowed. You're only allowed to count on this gospel. And this is the difficult piece. You are not allowed to provide for yourself any more than a sheep is allowed to care for itself, any more than one of the Israelites in Sinai was allowed to gather extra manna just in case. You have to count 100% on God to provide the one who is the king of this kingdom. You don't need gold or silver or copper or, in verse 10, Richard, a bag for your journey or even two coats or sandals or a staff for the worker is worthy of his support. You don't need to make provision for anything. Imagine telling a shepherd, you don't even need a staff. Don't take a spare coat. Everything you need will be provided as you go. You don't need a bag to carry anything with you. It's beautiful. It's radical. And I think, in a way, gives us a deeper understanding of what Paul is saying when he's discussing the income of the one who teaches. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of the wages. So Paul is pressuring the assembly with the instruction 
to feed the one who teaches, which means it's the instruction that's providing food for the one who teaches. Because on the one hand, in everyday terms, Paul is saying to the church, you have to provide for the one who teaches. But the pressure to provide is coming from the Torah. You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, which means it's not the church that is paying the one who teaches. The payment is coming from the instruction that pressures the church. It's beautiful. So even in Paul's letters, where this teaching works itself out practically, all credit and all glory always go to the instruction, which fits precisely with the Lord's admonition in the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew. You get no credit for what you do. All credit goes to the Father. In the Greek, it says that the worker is worthy of his food. It's very specific. The food comes from the work. The work itself is what provides the food. The challenge to the apostles, to the disciples, is are you willing to live or die on this teaching? Are you willing to live when this teaching says to live? And are you willing to die when the teaching is ready for you to die? Are you willing to come and go according to the will of the Father, the one who gave you this teaching? The fact that this is food that the worker is worthy of connects very directly with what you said, Father, from First Timothy, which is the ox is able to eat from the work that it's performing. The food is what the disciples are able to live off of, but this food that they are imparting to others is the teaching. As they are doing the work, they are able to eat what the teaching provides. It's not a buying and selling in earthly terms. It's whether you're willing to live or die according to this teaching. It's the instruction, but here in Matthew, with this metaphor of the shepherd and the journey, the movement without possession, right? You have to move quickly. It almost has this hint of exodus where you don't let your bread rise because you're on the move. We have to move quickly. If that's the kind of movement here where you take nothing and you just go, if Israel, if the lost sheep of Israel don't avail themselves of what the shepherd is offering, they'll be left behind. The individual sheep is non-functional without the flock. So this really is a last opportunity. It's like a ship leaving and the announcement going out, we depart in 15 minutes. If you're not on board, you'll be left behind. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.